Um, I'm going to be talking about Romans chapter 8, one of the greatest chapters in the whole Bible. I probably say that every time, but seriously, uh, Romans 8 might just be my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. It is power-packed. Fun fact, did you know that during the time that the book of Romans was written, it was written by the Apostle Paul, during that time, even in Rome, the capital city of the Roman Empire, that the largest number of people that could fit in the synagogues was 50 people. They averaged between 10 and 50 people, but most of the church in that day were house churches. And, and that was the most powerful, most forcefully advancing generation uh, of the church in all of history in the face of so much persecution, yet they gathered in numbers even smaller than this. So imagine what God can do right here in this crowd. Amen? And this is so reminiscent of a, an upper room, 120 kind of crowd, where God does extra special things. And um, I know that you guys love the word of God, don't you? I'm glad that you chose to be here on a Wednesday night in the middle of your week. God's going to be so faithful um, through his word to build us up in our most holy faith. Do you love the word of God? Yeah. Do you, I guess you are here whether you want to or not. <laughs> oh, there's a Saturday Night Live sketch from back in the day. Like, thank you for attending this mandatory assembly. You will not regret your time here. I'm so glad you love the Word of God. I do too. And we are literally going to dive into the Word of God. There's a lot of reading, a lot of note taking. And um, so be ready to take some notes. In fact, I printed a few extra copies of my notes to give out to any of you who might be interested. And I even printed out one copy. Probably should have uh, printed out more of a commentary on this chapter that's just incredible. And so why don't we start with prayer? God, we love you so much. Father, I thank you, God, that we get to come together in the middle of our week in your house, in your name. God, that we get to worship you together in, in freedom. God, that we get to um, experience this life that you intended for us. Father, I pray, God, by the power of your spirit, that tonight through your word, you will reveal to us that there is more that can be lived, God, as we live by your spirit. God, I pray that you'll open our eyes to see that there's more for us. God, I pray that you'll give us handles to know how to take hold of the more that you have available to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is enough. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message, my teaching tonight, because this is just like a really big small group, really, isn't it? We're just learning together. This is my favorite kind of environment. Um, the title of our teaching is The Life of the Spirit. The Life of the Spirit. Because we'll find that Romans 8 really reveals a lot of the benefits of the life of the Spirit. I love talking about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever experienced baptism in the Holy Spirit. But what an amazing experience. And if you haven't, I hope that by the end of this message that you will hunger for that. And I'm so thankful that it's not something that we have to measure up to, but the blood of Christ qualifies us for this amazing gift that's available to us. And it's a gift that God always intended for us to have. And he is so faithful to give us um, his spirit when we ask. We don't have to beg. We don't have to plead and cry. Um, in fact, um, the Bible compares God giving us the gift of the Spirit with um, the greatest gifts that a father could ever give their children, right? He said, if, if, if you fathers, though you're sinful, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does your father in heaven, how much more willing is he to give the Spirit specifically to those who ask him? And so we have been blessed with this amazing gift of living a life of the Spirit. And are we living that life like we really could? Did you know that the, the true Christian life is a supernatural experience from its beginning to its end? Anything that we can do in and of ourselves is a work of the flesh and is less than what God has for us. In fact, all that Jesus did and accomplished for us has a lot to do, everything to do with this gift of the Spirit that he desires to give us. It's a lot like 
a farmer because we are so utterly dependent on God to be able to live this Christian life and to live by the Spirit, yet there's responsibilities on us, cooperation on our end that are required in order for us to really live this life that God intended. Think about it, a farmer. He does a lot of work, doesn't he? He toils, he tills the soil, he's getting everything ready, he plants the seed, he waters. He does a lot of work, but at the end of the day, he's utterly dependent on God to bring the harvest. It's a lot like that in the life of the Spirit. We are completely dependent on God for all of it, yet he will not do what the farmer can do. He will not do what we ought to do on our end, and we're going to talk about that. Yet we're so, as hard as we work, we're that much more dependent on him when it's all said and done to really live that life. Here's a few things about the Holy Spirit before we dive into Romans 8. We believe in that second experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? The Bible says that when we, were, when we believed in Jesus, we were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. But then, and we see even in the example of the, the lives of the disciples, when he was still walking the earth, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But then the resurrected Jesus talked about another experience. And he told them to wait in Jerusalem. And he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And boy, did they. And we see in the example of their lives how they went from, they fled when Jesus was crucified. They had no courage. They were very cowardly, hiding for their lives. But then this huge turnaround happens after they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. What happens? We suddenly see Peter giving this, he was as fearful as the rest of them. Yet suddenly he's as bold as he could possibly be preaching the first sermon. We see such a mighty turnaround when the Holy Spirit comes into their lives in power. And this has always been so interesting to me. But wouldn't it be nice if we could walk with Jesus in the flesh like the disciples got to? I've always wanted to be able to have lived in that time and walked with Jesus in the flesh. But would you believe that Jesus said it's better that we have the Holy Spirit than to get to walk with Jesus in the flesh? He said Listen to this, John chapter 16. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. No longer do we have a visual in front of us of what righteousness looks like. Now we have literally got an internal compass that points us towards righteousness. And he will convict the world of judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I love this part. Listen to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Here's a few fun facts about the Holy Spirit. Did you know he is the one that executes all of the activities of God on the earth? It wasn't just God the Father who created and then Jesus came into the picture and then the Holy Spirit came. No, the Bible tells us that the Spirit was actively involved even in creation. And to this day, he's involved in all the activities of God on the earth. This was always so interesting to me. Did you know that Jesus, fully God, fully man, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he was tempted right after that to use his God-like abilities, but he knew that that was not the deal. That was not the way to go. And, and so he limited himself to the very power that was available to you and me as well. Everything Jesus did in his ministry was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Didn't he say that you will do all these things and even greater works than these? We have the same power in us that Jesus had. Even the power that in, 
through which he endured the cross. Even the power that raised him from death to life, the Bible says now, is in us. That is just really cool. Isn't that neat? The church without the spirit is like the body without blood. We all have different religious backgrounds coming from the south. And a lot of us have seen the Holy Spirit as something that's really optional and um, something that some denominations are cool with. And they usually are kind of weird about it. And so, you know, I kind of refrain, you know, re- you know, refrain from all of that. But that is a misconception of the Holy Spirit. There is no true church of Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. In fact, we cannot even understand or fathom our need for a Savior or the gospel message without the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The church without the Spirit is like the body without blood. He's not an optional side dish. He's the heat in the oven. Amen? Well, why don't we dive right into Romans 8, because we're going for it. I mean, we're diving into this entire chapter. Are you ready for this? Martin Luther said this about Romans 8, and I couldn't agree more. This letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily as though it were the bread of the soul. I love that. And I agree. This chapter contains everything we need in order to live a victorious life of the Spirit. And this is the life that God intended. And, and so some people worry, like, if I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit, does that mean I'm, I'm not saved? And, and, and there's a difference between, you know, being saved and being eternally secure, and, but also then living the life to the fullest of what God has for you in the here and now. And God has so much for us to experience and live right now that we don't want to miss out on. I don't want to barely get by. I want to have all that God has for me. And that desire is all you need in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Side note, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I grew up Pentecostal. I thought I was already filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was a teenager, and we just had a random cheerleaders Bible study over at Grammy's house at the White House. And um, I wasn't asking to be filled with the Spirit. I was just so hungry for more of God. I just wanted a touch from God. And it was so sincere from the depths of my heart. And I was just praying and crying. And I'll never forget as the lady, I don't even remember her name, but she had her hand right over my head. And I felt physical waves of the power of God. I could barely stand up under it. She didn't even touch me. And um, that's when I knew, okay, it is real when people fall out in the spirit because it was everything in me not to do that and tongues just flowed and it was an amazing experience and it took me a day or two to think ah I was baptized in the Holy Spirit I thought I already was (laughs) but how sweet and God will do that for each and every one of us all of our experiences are different and so there's no condemnation in this and um but God is so if you have that desire God put it there And he will give you that. And and we're not limited by our feelings. But God um, is so big that he blesses us to have experiences that are undeniable in his presence and through his spirit. And I'm so thankful for that. Let's, let's, Let's go forward in this. Have you ever battled regret? You're going to see that Romans 8 gives us tools for everything that could come against the the Christian life and the life of the Spirit that is rightfully ours through Jesus Christ. Have you ever battled regret? Have you ever just faced condemnation for your past? Like, you know Jesus has forgiven you. Your head knows it, but it keeps returning to you, and you keep reliving everything you did wrong. And as soon as you face something in life, you think, well, maybe I'm being punished because of all the things that I've done wrong. Has that ever been you? Well, listen up. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He became sin 
so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's enough. That is enough. The Holy Spirit gives us freedom. And we have to declare that sometimes daily uh, against the regret that the devil tries to throw at us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because I no longer live that way. I live according to the Spirit. Next, have you ever battled depression? The people of God battle these things. It's not just you. Have you ever battled fear, crippling fear, that really affects your quality of life? Have you ever battled anxiety? It's not just you. Listen to this. Any thought that isn't obedient to Christ, any thought that takes over your mind and isn't godly, do you battle anything like that? Listen to this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Now, before you freak out and think, oh, no, I must not be, I must not have the Spirit. Maybe I'm just, you're questioning everything. We still face that battle. We still make that decision daily. Are we going to have the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit? You'll come into a new battle in a new season where you will have to choose again. I'm going to live by the spirit. I'm going to have the mind of the spirit and not of the flesh. The Holy Spirit gives us a sound mind. This is such an important tool. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm telling you, this chapter is equipped with some good stuff to take you through pretty much anything you can face. Have you ever battled sickness in your body? Or have you just ever battled weariness? You just, you know, life is going too fast for you to catch up and get the strength you need to thrive. Have you ever been there? Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Oopsies, hold on. Backing up, verse 9. You are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and anyone, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If there's any tinge of insecurity in your heart, ooh, all you have to do is ask. That is simple, and that is done tonight before you leave in Jesus' name. That is not something you have to wonder or worry about anymore. That is not God's will. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him, I love this, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Gosh, I love that one, and I say that one a lot. I don't know about you, but when I'm not feeling well, this has lifted me out of the mire time and again. Of course, this is referring to the resurrection of our bodies when Jesus returns. And we have that to look forward to. We're going to talk more about that in a second. But I, through personal experience, can vouch that the Spirit gives life even to our mortal bodies when we need him. That's just awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right, you don't have to raise your hand here, but... Have you ever battled weakness in your flesh? Have you ever battled a vice? Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to the Spirit. If somebody gives you a really good gift, it's kind of an obligation to take it. You take it. It's just the right thing to do. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit empowers us for new habits and new character. We are able through the Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body. That's really awesome. But it also leaves us with no excuse. Because um, the Spirit has overcome the law of sin and death in our lives. So we can speak that in the face of our temptation. But we also don't get to use the excuse, I can't help it. We 
We lost that when we gained life through the Spirit. And you can help it. And God does always provide a way out when we face temptation. Have you ever battled insecurity? Unsure of your identity or your place? We've all felt insecure. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba literally means Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The Holy Spirit confirms in our spirit that God is our Father. Isn't that incredible? And it's interesting, though, how unworthy we are to be considered co-heirs with Christ. And I like that he puts the stipulation, if we are willing to also share in his sufferings, are we willing to suffer for our love and commitment to God, like Jesus did? Sometimes suffering is as small as walking away from something we enjoy doing, but we know it's not pleasing to him. If we can't do that, how can we be trusted with something greater, a greater opportunity to suffer for Jesus Christ? We've got to start where we are. We can experience the suffering of stepping away from some things we kind of liked for the sake of our love for God. Amen? The Holy Spirit positions us in our relationship with God, and it affirms our relationship with God as his children. And he solidifies and secures our identity. That's huge. Have you ever lost perspective in life? That's easy to do sometimes. Maybe troubles in your life and in the season you're in are mounting up and they just become so big that you really lose sight of what Jesus really accomplished for you and what really matters. Because if we could hold on to that, really nothing can steal our joy and our faith. Yet we find ourselves wallowing and when we get to that point, we've lost perspective, haven't we? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, Paul continues. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait patiently for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. I love this. For in this hope we were saved. We forget that we have a hope that's greater than the matters of this world. Yes, I want to be secure in my identity. Yes, I want to experience a great life and peace and joy. But there is a hope that is way bigger and better than that. And that's the whole point for which we were saved in the first place. And we forget this. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. That reminds us there's more than what we have. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Did you know that the first generation church, this powerful, amazing generation of Christian believers, they were convinced that Jesus was going to return in their lifetime? And you can see the kind of tenacity that 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 belief brought to them in the face of persecution. Yet we have all this comfort. And it's funny how we kind of forget that. Or if I'm honest, I do. I forget that what we believe and what we've been given is bigger than what we see. And this world is passing, and there's something that we get to look forward to. And this is the hope that, that for which we were saved in the first place. And I think it's so important for us to get our eyes back on eternity, to long for the coming of our Savior once again, just like that first generation of believers did. There's so much power in having that kind of perspective. The Holy Spirit reminds us that there's more. The Bible says he's a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. He's just a foretaste of the great experience we get to have for all of eternity. If you've ever had a moment in the presence of God, that moment of being filled with the Holy Spirit, that ecstatic moment that you cannot deny or ever forget, that is so small compared to what we have to look forward to. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. But this is a sobering thought that Paul said in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, 
We are of all people most to be pitied. Mm -mm. Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the circumstances or demands or pressures of life? Or maybe there's a storm that is just pretty big. Have you ever been so overwhelmed that you couldn't even pray? Or you just sit in God's presence and you're, I've been there. I've been there to where I'm just sitting there and I'm like, God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Just on repeat. I've been there. We get to places where we don't even know what to pray. But praise God. Listen to what the Spirit does for us. Moving on. We're now at verse 26 of Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Praise God for that. Amen. God did not leave us hanging in any way. He, th- he thought of everything. The Holy Spirit helps us in every way. And I love that we have the Spirit interceding on our behalf. We also have Jesus Christ, our high priest, also interceding on our behalf. Those are our two witnesses in the courts of the Most High of Heaven. Praise God for that. We have everything we need. Amen? Thank God that the Spirit helps us when we don't know what to pray. God thought of it all. Have you ever found yourself facing something that was just unbearable? Or this is the one... This is the final nail in the coffin. This one's just too big for me. Anything unbearable yet in your life. My favorite part of this chapter, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What is your purpose in life? Our purpose is to be conformed into the image of his son. Everything else is secondary to that. That's our purpose in life. And God uses all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. One of my favorite scriptures of all time. Don't you love it? We need that over and over again. And you know what? This scripture was very timely for the original recipients, the Christians in Rome. Because they did not know it at the time, but it wasn't long after this letter that they faced the greatest persecution that any generation of Christians has ever faced. The great persecution against the Christians in the Roman Empire. They had no idea that that was right around the corner. Paul didn't know that when it was right around the corner when he wrote this. Often counselors will, will, will warn people to be careful when, when they're trying to console someone who's walking through something really tough. To not just, you know, throw around, hey, God uses all things together for the good. The time that we need to realize and grasp this truth for our own lives is before something really bad hits. Now is the time to decide that this is my stance. All things work together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. Because that is going to carry us through some tough times. The Holy Spirit reassures us that no matter what happens, it's all good. It's all going to be okay. Praise God. And here's a great ending to this chapter. Ooh, this is good. I call this the power passage. What then shall we say in response to these things? We've received some really good stuff. I mean, what can we say to all this? This is incredible. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? We ought to be the most secure and firmly established people in the world. Skipping forward, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That is a power passage. Amen? Because God loves us so much, he made victorious living available to us through the life of the Spirit. He made this available to us through the life of the Spirit. That's how much he loves us. Thank God for his great love for us. I don't even know how Christianity can get grouped in with the religions of this world, where, where it's people trying to measure up, trying to be something they could never be. Yet we have a God who came to us, who he took our punishment, and he made us righteous by his own sacrifice. And then he goes, I mean, as if like that's not... That's everything we could ever imagine and more. And then he places his spirit, his nature, his power in us to enable us to live the life that pleases him. Not only enable us to live the life that God intended, but to give us the desire to even want to. So, let's close with a few handles on this. This is all so good. The word of God is all we need. But it's a choice we have to make to live by the Spirit. We have to choose to have the mind of the Spirit over and over and over again. We have to choose, I'm not going to live by my flesh. You've been alive long enough to know that we can love Jesus and still be so impatient. We can be so mean. We can be so selfish. Okay? But we have the power to live by the Spirit. The Spirit of love, joy, peace. Can I get an amen? Amen. Patience, mamas. (laughs) Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These might have nothing to do with the personality you were born with, but God has given you this very spirit to live by. So how do we cultivate like the farmer? What's our end of this? How do we do it? Let's close with some handles, and they're basic, okay? But these are so absolutely important. They're like the earth, air, and water of the spiritual life. You ready? Three things. How do we cultivate a life of the Spirit? By the Word of God, by prayer, and good deeds. You've got to have all three. The Word of God, prayer, and good deeds. So let's really quick remind ourselves of some benefits of the Word of God and prayer and good deeds and why they are so important to God. First of all, we cultivate a life of the Spirit By the word of God. Not only reading it, but applying it and allowing it to shape our lives. We humbly approach the word of God as the authority over our lives. And we allow it to shape us. We don't pick and choose. We allow it to perform surgery on our lives. And that's the first thing that it does. It performs surgery on us, doesn't it? Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to dividing even bone and marrow, soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We can do everything right on the outside, but the word of God won't let us get away with having the wrong motives. It judges even our very motives for even the right things we do. We've got to allow the, the word of God to do its work in us. The Word of God transforms us and renews our minds. Romans 12, 2, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Praise God for that. It it gives us guidance and direction. Psalms 119, David said, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, like D-Rod just said earlier, and a light unto my path. Thank God that we're not left in the dark. We have the Word of God that gives us everything we need to succeed in our Christian life. The Word of God is... Um, useful to thoroughly, I love that the word says that, thoroughly equip us for every good work. The word of God is useful to equip us for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And finally, the Word of God cultivates a life of the Spirit by familiarizing us with His ways. The Word of God familiarizes us with the ways of God. As soon as something bad hits, 
and we begin to think, oh, I'm being punished. No, we remember that the word of God says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the word of God tells me that my faith is being tested and it is of more worth than gold. And out of this, I will be stronger and develop perseverance and endurance. And the word of God also tells me that God will use this, even this awful, unfair situation for my good because I am called according to his purpose. The Word of God cultivates a life of the Spirit because it familiarizes us with the ways of God. Also, prayer. We've talked a lot about prayer lately, but this is a non-negotiable, essential to living the victorious life that God offers us through His Spirit. We've been in the best season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's been my favorite so far, and we're just seeing so many great miracles. And one of the things that I've been praying for Have you ever had a season in your life where God was just so real to you and you were just so in love with him? For a lot of us, it's that that first season after we gave our hearts to him and we experienced salvation and everything's so real and you just can't get enough of reading the word of God. and, And I've been hungering for that, that level of just renewed passion in my relationship with God. And our relationship with God is like really any other relationship or a marriage. It, it, it has its ebbs and flows, and there's times when we're like, eh. But, and that's when we need to lean in because God is never, eh. It's us getting distracted. It's us um, needing to turn some things off so that we can lean into him. And so that's been one of my um, prayers this, during this time of praying and fasting. And, um, and I'm so thankful that I'm, I'm sensing that. And, and, and so this has been just special for me personally, that God, um, and that's what he does through prayer. One of the things he does is it draws him near to us when we draw near to him. And it softens our hearts towards him again. And so I'm so thankful for that. Prayer also realigns our will. It realigns our will. We remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was like, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Prayer aligns our will with the will of the Father. It realigns our perspective. I love Joel's, um, not Joel, Job's example. Hopefully none of us will ever suffer on the level that he did. Um, And he was so consumed with all the horrible things that were happening to him. And his prayers were all just about how this is not fair. And he handled it a lot better than most any of us would have. But then God comes back and answers him, and he kind of lets him have it. And he's like, um, let me fix your perspective, buddy. Were you there when I laid the earth's foundation? By the end of God's talk, Job was, he was silenced. And he was just like, woe is me. What was I thinking to talk to you in that way? I love how we can come to God. And by the end of a time of prayer, our perspective is realigned. Oh, God, I forgot you're the great I am. I forgot you're bigger than my problems. I love that that prayer does that for us, don't you? Prayer enables us to receive direction from God. We see this over and again in the Bible. Prayer accomplishes God's will in our lives. It's through prayer that we see miracles and great things. I love James 5.16. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And when we see God's will accomplished in our lives and we see miracles, our faith is built. So prayer builds faith. And I know we've shared the example of of our buddy who during these 21 days of prayer, God has just softened his heart towards God and has quickened his ear towards the Spirit. And he was in a waiting room and prayed for a stranger whose wife was terminally ill. And, um, And the guy calls a couple days later or later that day, and God had miraculously healed his wife. And, and so this is just our buddy right here, Ron. He prayed for, the, God put it on his heart to pray for a stranger, for his wife. She wasn't even there. He didn't lay hands on her. And, and, and yet we see this really awesome miracle. But it didn't stop there. And um, because I was so inspired, my faith was so just, um, oh my gosh, stirred by this. Like God is still doing some crazy awesome stuff that I called my dear friend whose son, 
Um, we, we, we prayed for Will earlier. God just gave me a powerful faith to believe God's going to do this for Will. And I called her with such faith and confidence to minister to her, and we prayed for his healing. And so that's what happens. Not only is your faith stirred, and not only does your faith grow, not only do you see a miracle, but that is contagious. And who knows how many miracles will take place and how many people's faith are inspired just from that one story. And that's why it's so good to share what God is doing in our lives, because it, it is exponential, what God can do through prayer. Prayer gives us strength. We know that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And finally, prayer cultivates a life of the Spirit by familiarizing us with his voice. We get to know the voice of God when we spend time with him. Prayer cultivates a life of the Spirit because it makes us familiar with the voice of God. Finally, good deeds. These are all non-negotiables. We've got to have the word of God. We've got to have prayer. And we've got to have good deeds in order to live the victorious life that God offers us through his spirit. First of all, we were created to do good works. It's good to be reminded of that. There's a lot more than just what we ought to be. There are specific things that the word of God says we were created to do. That's so important. And like we mentioned earlier, the Bible equips us for what? For good works. For every good work God has in store for us to do, we have everything we need because of the word of God. Good deeds are the acceptable religion to our Father. We can get everything right and miss the deeds, and we've missed all of it. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I think it's interesting that he puts it in that order. And finally, we know that faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. James said, I'll show you my faith by what I do. James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's kind of like if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it. Did it really fall? If I can't see by your life that you have faith, do you have it? In one of the heaviest scriptures of all time that is very convicting to me, Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Good deeds, doing good deeds cultivates a life of the Spirit by familiarizing us As we begin to step out in obedience, as I mentioned before, the voice of the Spirit gets more clear. That gift of the Spirit that's just a small spark is fanned into flame as we step out on that small hunch that maybe it's Him telling us to witness. Maybe it's Him telling us to pray for a stranger in the supermarket. Each time we step out, just in case that still small voice is the Spirit, I promise you that voice gets louder and louder and that visible experience of his power is addicting it is so addicting and then you realize this is the life i was created for amen and so look we cultivate the life of the spirit by these three non-negotiable essentials the word of god prayer and good deeds i call those the three stranded cord the three stranded cord the secures victorious living Ecclesiastes 4.12 says one can be overpowered, two can defend themselves. In other words, they can get by, but a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. You can do one of these things. You can have the word of God down. You know it the best of anybody, but your, your prayer life is lacking to non-existent. And if you look back over your life, you're a little bit too busy with the average demands of life to really do any good works to get involved in building your church, to help people in need. So maybe if one of, things, one of these things sound great, you'll be overpowered. 
Maybe you got two out of the three, okay? A prayer life is pretty solid right now, you know, and, you know, I'm, I, you know, I regularly attend this outreach, and, you know, I'm on a serve team, but you haven't really allowed the Word of God to craft your character. You really are not committed in taking seriously the opportunity to study and know the Word of God. Two out of three, you could get by. But three, a three-stranded cord. If you've got all these three, these three things going in your life, the Word of God, actively shaping you. You've got prayer that you're faithful with, praying to the living God every day. And if you have good deeds, that you take seriously that your your convenience, your energy, your time, what God has given you as your resources are used for the good of others, I can promise you, you're going to live the life that God intended every season. Your victorious living in the Spirit is secure. That's the life of the Spirit. That's how we cultivate it. Everybody stand. We're just going to close in prayer. I hope that blesses you. It's a lot of scripture. Praise God. And I've got a few extra copies if, you, if any of you want to take them. But let's just close in prayer. Every, every head bowed and eye closed. God, we just worship you. I want to give you the opportunity I would hate to have a stack of a million dollars up here and talk for 20 minutes about how you can get a million dollars when I could just give it to you. And so if you're here tonight and you, maybe you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't have to be a big showdown. It doesn't have to be where all the planets align and everything's just right. All you have to do is desire what God has for you. And if that's you, we want to make that happen tonight. I believe that that's God's will for you that that desire is from him or maybe it's something you're not sure if you've had or it's a place of insecurity for you I want to pray for you too and so if that's any of you I want to invite you just to go ahead and come forward and we're going to pray together we're just going to pray together for that and also perhaps if there's any specific area of this that ministered to you tonight that you want prayer for Maybe you know you need to grow in one of these three essentials and and, and your love and passion and commitment to the Word of God, or maybe in prayer, or maybe in doing good deeds. If there is anything that you want prayer for in this, if you you know that there is more to the life that you're living, you want to live a victorious life of living by the Spirit, I want to invite you, if you'd like to come forward, and I'll pray with you. But let's go ahead and all just pray together, every head bowed, and I just God, we just, we love you so much. God, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus, through your body, your death on the cross, that our sins were paid for. I thank you, Lord, that you defeated death and were resurrected to new life. And for that reason, we have this hope. God, the very resurrection of our own bodies, Lord God, that we have the same power available to us uh, through which you accomplished every great work of your ministry, through which you literally defeated death, hell, and the grave. God, I thank you that this is available to us. Lord, I thank you, God, for this life. Lord, I pray that if we're stopping short in any way, that you would reveal it to our hearts. God, we don't want to stop short of the amazing, incredible, victorious life that you have for us. God, I just pray that you will help us, God, to uh, to see our own blind spots. God, places maybe that we still need to re- re- surrender to your spirit. But God, we just we just want what you have for us. We want you. God, we want you. Father, right now, we just thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you've given us ways that we can powerfully cultivate this life that you offer us. Thank you for your word. That is all we need, God, for every good work. God, I thank you for the the gift of prayer. God, that you literally opened up the way for us to have communication and relationship with a holy, living God. God, I pray that we will never take that lightly. And God, I just thank you that you've given us good works to do. God, that we, we have great purpose in our lives, God. We can live a life that is fulfilling, that is changing the world around us, God, as we simply see and meet the needs around us. 
God, I pray that you'll stir our hearts to step in on a new level to serve your house, to build your church as the beacon of hope to our community. God, we love you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you to do a fresh work in each and every heart. Lord, we love you. We want all that you have for us. We, we thank you for the seeds that you've planted tonight, God, the things that you've reminded us of tonight, Lord. We, we honor you for that. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.